talking about this subject. And the other half probably know even more than I do. So it's a bit of a worry to be doing this at this time, but we'll see how it goes. Uh, as Betty said, I've been a museum curator and a university lecturer stroke um, educationalist. And I really wanted to be a teacher when I was at university, um, but I thought museums seemed to be a better option. I'd had a, a good experience of museums when I was a, a student. And I thought it'd be great to have lots of specimens to deal with and help other people um, deal with their interest in geology. So with that in mind, that's really where I'm coming from uh, with this talk. I'm not a, a, an out and out academic. I'm more concerned with the public appreciation of geology and getting people in, involved in things and getting people to think about things and examine things. Is that okay? Um, I've just lost my... just lost my mouse there we go so you okay. just click instead okay um if you go down to kent station as well as looking at the locomotive which i'm sure you've done is it locomotive 36 you know the age it was running you know the age it was put there not so bad you also might go there to look at the the sculpture uh, of thomas kent who after whom the station is named worthy recipient a uh, worthy person to name the station after the thing you probably have not looked at in the past is that <laughs> and i have a long and um, uh, uh, devoted history in, in letterbox uh, history and you've got one of the earliest letterboxes in britain still in use on the streets well still in use in the station it should have a little flap on it it dates from 1857 59 something like that um, and it's it's in use with your postal service rather than our postal service. So originally uh, it would have been red and now obviously it's green. But that's the only one of its type on the streets anywhere in the British Isles. There are a couple of other ones to be found, one in a museum collection uh, in Salford and then other ones at the post office museum collection. They should be something like this. It was called the Art and Science Letterbox. And you think, well, one earth has got to do with geology. Well, nothing at all as it happens. Um, but I just want people to sort of get used to using their eyes to look at things around them. Came out as the art and science box, had all those sort of scrolly bits and they were picked out in gold. The little green one next to that great big red one um, is how it looked, but it was too expensive to make. So they had a, a sort of bog standard version, which is just the one you see in front of you. There was a flap on the top to keep the weather out. Um, that's gone now, but because it's inside, it doesn't really matter too much. So next time you're down that way by the station, go and have a look. You won't be disappointed. Um, Betty was sent down there by me some years ago to take a photograph and she did her job admirably well. Uh, OK, I'm just trying to find. Um, should I talk about Archbishop Usher? Is that sort of is that allowed from the south of Ireland talking about the north? Um, we've got this chap to thank for lots of things. Uh, well, not thank probably not he worked out from the bible that the the uh, earth was formed at 4004 bc going back generations in the bible and he also tied it down to october 22nd which you know was sort of last week in, in basic terminology so it's an anniversary uh, quickly work out the number of years i can't quite do it myself um but he reckoned that it was 4004 bc so the age of the earth was 6000 years old and that was in whatever the date is, 15, 16, 86. Um, and people were a bit constrained by that time scale. As geologists, we're a bit more familiar with this sort of time scale. And you know, as geologists, you'll know that the time scale was erected on the basis of fossils. So the earliest fossils, supposedly, were 570 million years old at the start of the Cambrian. Nothing before then, nothing back to the start of the earth about 4,500 million years ago. Nowadays, we're a bit more enlightened and fossils have been found right back as far as 2,500 million. So this time scale that we've got is a bit out of date as regards fossil history. But for a long time, people didn't really know what fossils were. The ancients, they had a pretty good idea. They worked out that the shells they found in rocks were a bit like the shells they found on the seashore. So they thought the, the, the sea must have moved a bit and deposited shells all over the place. 
But then there's this sort of gap for about 2000 years, right up to medieval times when people didn't really have an idea as to what fossils were. And they came up with all sorts of strange ideas. They were called sports of nature, things put there by God to amuse and entertain man. Um, nowadays, you think it's sort of, well, how odd? I mean, we know what fossils are, but only because we're a bit more enlightened than they were. They thought some of the spiral shells that you come across were just solutions going through the earth uh, and actually sort of mixing together and sort of spiraling and making these sort of strange shapes. Um, the first person who had a, a reasonable idea uh, and put all this down in, in sort of writing was, was Linnaeus. And he introduced this idea of having two part Latin names, binomial names if you want the flashy term for it. Um, you know, Homo sapiens is being the one that we all know uh, and Homo sapiens is based on Linnaeus. So his, his skeleton, his remains, are in fact the type specimen. That's an interesting thing to sort of leave to science. I'm not sure where they are, probably in Sweden somewhere. And you're saying, okay, well, so, well, so what? Why has he got this picture up of uh, Fossilia hantoniensia? Well, this book was the first book in the UK to use this new fangled two name system for fossils. Before then, they'd all had sort of strange names. So something in Germany, something in France, something in Britain would have had three different names for the same thing. Linnaeus said, well, let's call them all a Latin based name. Uh, just to confuse people, and they'll all have the same name. They might have a local vernacular name, but they'll all have the same Latin name, so scientists can sort of speak together, uh, uh, speak uh, and understand each other uh, through Latin. So this book was produced in, what, 1766. The, the system really started in 1758. As I said, the first book in Britain, and it's in my part of the world. Uh, I was the keeper of geology uh, for Hampshire Museums, and this chap, uh, had the manor of, of Christchurch down in the south of the county and he collected fossils from the cliffs. Well, I say he, like many of these early sort of geologists, I think he paid locals to find stuff and then he sort of said he found them. Um, and that, that's, that's typical of many of the fossil finds taking place in, in the early part of history. And his was the first book to be produced. It produced, he, he produced lovely um, illustrations, plates, and the fossils are still identifiable in the British Museum, even today, just from these illustrations. They were so good, the plates were excellent. It wasn't until the 1830s that a version came out in English for folks like you and I um, to understand. I'm afraid we didn't do Latin at my school, um, unfortunately. What got me into geology was a visit to this place. And this is a, a, an engraving by Turner, uh, one of these sort of landscape, landscape uh, artists of Britain, and when the outdoors became so popular, they went round to romantic places, mountains, lakes, coastal locations, uh, and he did sort of bread and butter work that he sold to people um, like this. You could also get them sort of coloured up, and this is 1811, early part of his career, and in fact it represents Lulworth Cove, as you can, you can imagine, and as a, a fourth form geography student, I went to this place on a geography field trip, and I was interested in, or well, I came away interested in geology, and it sort of formed my career, and it sort of, it's uh, brought me into an understanding of the landscape, and what it does, and what the rocks are, and things like that. So I'm not a sort of true academic geologist, I'm a sort of landscape geologist, I'm a specimen geologist, and I like talking to people about landscapes, and what they can tell us. And uh, you might have been there, but you can sort of see what is the bottom right hand picture is the, the Lulworth crumple, a big fold. And if you think that um, all rocks were laid down or deposited in flat layers, anything different to that means they've been affected by earth movements. And people say, oh yeah, it must have been plate movements and, and all sorts of things. And in this case, the idea is that um, back in geological time, Africa drifted north into Europe and formed the Alps and it sort of rippled across the whole of Europe and came up and, and formed these folds in, in southern Britain. Mm, not exactly, um, uh, but it's sort of, it's a, it's a good story and one, one hates to spoil it. Uh, there were some movements of land up and down and these rocks uh, fell off the edge of a block and had these lovely sort of crumples and things. In. This is the Lulworth crumple in, in Stair Hole. Why am I not changing? Okay. 
I should explain I came from Dorset. I come from Dorset. You probably guessed from my accent. And in West Dorset, we've got um, uh, Mary Anning, um, the quote there, saleswoman to a new science. She made her money, uh, or she made income for her family uh, after her father died um, by finding fossils and selling them to people. Uh, there's still a sort of good trade in that at Lyme Regis today. Some of you might have been there, and if you've not been there, it's worth going to have a look. There she is, down on the Dorset coast, big hammer, a bit big for a sedimentary sort of uh, person, but not too bad. Um, and in fact, the cliffs were being worked by people for cement stones. So they were taking away the, the limestones, crushing them into, into uh, smaller blocks, and then putting them through the kilns um, to make uh, cement. Uh, so she had plenty of material to work with, and she was selling them to, to tourists, to visitors, and to scientists who came down. And they often sort of passed the work off as their own, you know, describing the latest specimen found by this little lady down in Dorset. Um, and Lyme Regis is worth going to. Um, she found the first ichthyosaur, the first plesiosaur, found all sorts of odd dinosaur bones and pterodactyl bones, and all sorts of things. She provided the material that the famous scientists of the day described and um, got, got the credit for, if one's honest. You might have seen in the press, or you might not have seen, but you are aware now, there's a new film just out called Ammonite. Um, if I say based on Mary Anning, it's, it's loosely based on Mary Anning and her fossil collecting on the cliffs. I've not seen it yet. Uh, I'm not sure if I will go and see it um, in the same way that one or two other films that have taken uh, that have been made aren't strictly accurate, but they're good cinema. And if you're interested in Dorset scenery, you'll go and see it. If you're interested in Kate Winslet, you'll go and see it. And if you're interested in lots of other things, you might well go and see it as well. But put it on your list. Ammonite. Um, it's a bit like the Tracy Chevalier book. Um, not a lot known about the woman, so let's sort of make up lots of things and make a good story out of it. Okay, those are the sort of cliffs she was dealing with, and the locals were digging out the, the limestone beds for the cement, and then putting a, a, aside all the, the shaly stuff, which got washed away by the sea. So there are lots of material to be found. The, uh, the plaque on a building, which is now the Philpot Museum, and that was where her house was, but it was knocked down um, to make the museum. And then she's buried in the local churchyard and the Geological Society uh, put up a, a window in her honor. The gravestone is nothing really sort of to write home about. It's more about um, other members of her family rather than her. But if you go to Lyme Regis, um, look at the lamp standards for a start. That's a sort of, it's a lovely coastal locality, a little harbor. If you remember the French Lieutenant's woman, uh, or from what, 20, 30 years ago? And um, that was where that was filmed. Uh, look at the ammonites on those lamp standards, not your bog standard municipal lamp to be found there. And every year they have a fossil uh, festival, normally in the, the, the Maybank holiday. And I was down there for one particular year and some enterprising youngsters had done this big fossil ammonite down on the, the beach and then advertised the fossil festival, as you can see from their writing in the sand. So lots of good people finding stuff, uh, mainly amateurs, and obviously lots of people do find things. If it's not their full-time job, they're the people we rely on. You all know what ammonites are. Lovely shelled, coiled, coiled shelled beasts. Uh, we find them in the rocks. There are plenty of them around and they're really quite good fun. And they're the basis of stratigraphy in the Jurassic. We know that, but in the past, people weren't quite so sure. They thought they were elongate things that were, in fact, coiled snakes. And um, if they found them in the cliffs, uh, they perhaps added on a sort of little appendage uh, to, sort of to help the story along. In this case, this is one of the ones from Whitby in, in North Yorkshire. And the shell is OK. The last couple of inches has been carved with a head to make it look like a, a coiled snake. And people have got a big thing about snakes. Uh, I blame it on to sort of Adam and Eve and, and Genesis. Um, the poor snake gets a raw deal, I think, um, from having uh, uh, 
coerced Eve into sort of uh, taking a bite of the apple. So they're known as snake stones, or they were known as snake stones, and they were sort of, um, uh, snake stones weren't to be encouraged. St Hilda, who, who was a, a monastic person or uh, an abbess person, wanted to build her uh, institution uh, in Whitby, and the locals said, well, yeah, you can build it on the top of the cliff, but you've got to get rid of our plague of snakes first. So with a holy rod, she sort of turned them all into stone. And here you've got a carving from a local church on the left-hand side showing all those Ammonites with snakes' heads on them. And even the stained glass window in one of the local churches shows uh, St Hilda, or Hilda as she's sometimes known, uh, with her Ammonites. The trouble was, if you went to the cliffs and you found a fossil in the cliffs, they didn't actually have a head on them. Um, so the locals, say, having carved on some, sold them to pilgrims and tourists. But if you found one that didn't have a head on, that was said to have suffered from St Cuthbert's curse, who came along and chopped all the heads off. Uh, so you were sort of covered both ways for the story. You could buy one in the shop with a head on. You could buy, uh, find one in the cliff yourself that didn't have a head on, and that had been decapitated by St Cuthbert, uh, a northeastern saint. I'm sure Betty will nod in agreement um, because she comes from that northern part of the world. So it entered the local folklore of Whitby. In the 17th century, there was a shortage of small change nationally. So local traders all over the place in, in England, certainly, I don't know whether you had it over in Ireland, presumably you did, they invented their own currency and put on their symbols for their particular business. And the tokens for Whitby had these, these sort of snake stones, coiled up and with a snake's head on them and a forked tongue coming out of the one at the top. That reappeared a couple of centuries later when in the 18th or 19th century, there was also a shortage of small change and they had these similar tokens and they could be used for trading uh, among people in the town. So Whitby and snake stones go hand in hand. That's 19th century. Okay, what have, the coat of arms for Whitby is shown here. Wavy lines um, showing the sea and the Ammonites showing a snake stones and the, the motto of the town. The early versions show it like this. The more modern version shows it like this. Uh, and green and snakes go together like sort of peaches and cream. Um, you know, if it's snakes worth its weight in gold, it's got to be in green um, because that's sort of a, a, an odd color, not, not to be encouraged. So snake stones are the first thing that people think about when they see Ammonites. The same thing happened down in Somerset. I'm sure one or two of you might remember Radio Luxembourg on a Sunday night when they had an advert from Horace Batchelor. Uh, and he had a, a scheme for um, sorting out the football pools and you could send off your money and he would send you a sort of the way to sort out your draws and score draws for the, for the, uh, the football pools. Um, and as a kid, I'd listen under the bedclothes as, one, as, as we did in those days. And he mentioned Horace Batchelor and he came from Canesham, spelt K-E-Y-N-S-H-A-M, Canesham, Bristol. And that's what the postal address you had to send stuff into. And the saint down there was St. Kyner. So not St. Hilda up in Whitby, but St. Kyner down in, in Somerset. And again, the locals, to help the legend along, um, uh, carved heads on the end. You can look on the internet today and you'll see some modern ones that aren't really very good. They're really obviously just sort of smoothed over and carved up. Um, but you do find sort of historic ones like this one that are um, a bit more sort of convincing, but they were just carved on. Down in Dorset, God's own county, um, you found these large ones, these large ammonites in the, the Portland stone. This was called the Fossil Garden. It was behind uh, a quarry office um, and it used to be sort of in all the guidebooks and they had there a range of things that came out of the quarry that were interesting. Uh, this is my brother, this is taken probably 40, 50 years ago even and we went there one day to have a look. You can see how big this particular one is and the locals, the quarrymen, tended to call them uh, conger eels um, because they were sort of huge uh, like conger eels are. You'll note it's got no head on it um, because as we know, uh, Ammonites are sort of related to sort of um, 
octopus and squid. Uh, so if you can imagine an octopus type animal plugged into the end of that shell, that's what the thing was like when it was alive. And I think, oh yeah, we've got a, a diagram. Um, the nearest living relative today is a nautilus and the picture on the, the left showing you a, a nautilus shell. And then a picture on the right showing you what the nautilus uh, would have looked like in life uh, with a head, tentacles uh, and note the huge eye. Um, they were really quite advanced creatures. Uh, so ammonites were really quite sort of forward, say forward looking, that sounds awful. Uh, but the ammonites were really quite an evolved set of things. They had, they had eyes, they could sort of do stuff. And they lived as predators and scavengers and all sorts of interesting uh, derivations. Um, some were streamlined, they were swimmers. Some were more bulbous, they were perhaps scavengers. And some were sort of huge things that lived on the seabed, uh, perhaps filtering through the sediment. But uh, imagine what an octopus uh, can do, and that's what the ammonites could probably do as well. So then why do you find uh, a nautilus stroke ammonite in the middle of a roundabout in East Sussex? Well, local geologists live nearby. Um, Gideon Mantell lived in Lewis, and uh, there's a plaque on his house where he lived. So when a new road was put through, they thought this roundabout would be a good place to sort of show this great big uh, Nautilus or, or Ammonite. Um, and he was finding all sorts of things um, down in Sussex. You also find, if I say straight Nautilus, imagine a Nautilus is a coral shell. But if you imagine it's a, a shell um, unraveled, just as a long straight, like an ice cream cone, there were those around as well. And you'll find these in, in London, we've got one in Winchester, and I don't know whether you've got any over your way. These are, are rocks that came from Sweden. They were cut, they were polished, they were used as paving slabs. They're of Ordovician age, so they're sort of quite ancient. And to all intents and purposes, if you thought they were Belenites, you're excused for thinking that. They are in fact nautiloids. And the giveaway is the top picture on the left that shows you that sort of um, indentation running in from the right side down the middle um, towards the left hand side. Although looking at the bottom picture, that big sort of white one uh, pointing towards the camera lens cap, which is 50 millimeters to give you some idea of scale, looks a bit like a belemnite, but they are all nautiloids. And in, in Sweden, they were known as Swedish nails because that's where the rock came from. And in China, uh, where the rock is also found with the same fossils, they're, they're known as Chinese pagodas. They look like the sort of pagoda shape uh, you'll find uh, in, in China. So next time you're in London and you go to St Paul's, look at the front steps uh, and the purplish stone has got these lovely fossils uh, all over them. The one we've got in Winchester was a, a tomb for the local MP's daughter. I don't know how he got it. It's just one paving or one slab the size of a, a tombstone, a sort of ledger stone set in the floor. Uh, and one imagines it perhaps sort of fell off the back of a cart and he sort of thought, that's a nice stone. I'll have that. And it'll do for one of our, our family graves in Winchester Cathedral. So look out for it if ever you get the chance to, to visit any of those places. The true Bellum Knights that you'll see here are similar in shape but different in their internal composition. They're known in various places as thunderbolts, devil's fingers and bat stones. Um, you know their nearest living relative today is a cuttlefish. And the, the business part of this beast is the, the triangle of gray stuff. Um, so there you've got the guard and at the right hand end of the guard is the, the bit where the animal lived. And it's got a shell and its shell is straight rather than coiled. And that's where the, the ammonite-like beast, the, the belemnite beast lived. And on the right-hand side, the old illustration shows you um, the shell of the belemnite with um, all the, the individual chambers. And that was sort of the, the living bit. As the animal got bigger, added more chambers on. And I, I'm embarrassed to say that uh, in my former museum in Peterborough, uh, there was a, a, a quote, I think it was from Country Life in 1946. Somebody wrote in saying, we were playing bowls. We had a thunderstorm. We all retreated to the clubhouse. We came back to the green after the thunderstorm had finished. And on the green, there was a, a thunderbolt, something that had come down from the skies, uh, from the heavens. 
and it was one of these balanites. They're, they're quite common in the local rocks there, the, uh, um, the, uh, the clay, the Oxford clay. And this was sort of mentioned and quoted. Um, so Thunderbolts is their sort of main name. Devil's Fingers in Scotland and Batstones from Scotland as well. How it came to be on the, the Bowling Green, one can only surmise. Um, perhaps it came from the gravel around the side of the Bowling Green. Um, perhaps it had worked its way up through the green, I don't know, but it certainly didn't come down from the thunderstorm um, from above. So even as late as what, 80 odd years ago, people were thinking there was some sort of devilish means for these, these things arriving uh, uh, where they were found. A picture showing what the Bellamites would have looked like, uh, looking very similar to a modern day cuttlefish, which you might well have seen. I was interested to find these. One of my daughters, daughter number two, not daughter number one, who was here just a moment ago. Uh, daughter number two is in Paris, and she took me out to the Natural History Museum in Paris, and I'd never seen opalized bellum nights before. Australian, there was thought to be a, a shallow sea in the center of Australia that sort of um, started to, to dry up, giving very acidic conditions. And the, the silica sort of went through the underlying sediments and it sort of opalized the fossils that were there, replacing the original shells. Uh, and I've never seen anything like it in Britain. Um, and I should look forward to seeing more of these things uh, as I look through museum collections that I visit in the future. So if ever you come across one of these things, they're from Australia. Uh, normal bellum nights, but with this lovely opalized replacement surface. A bit like we get flint replacements in the chalk in, in the UK. You'll be familiar with these. They're perhaps the most common fossil uh, and the most obvious shaped fossil to be found. A thing called Gryphea. It comes out of the Lias, the, the lower part of the Jurassic, and they occur all over the place, wherever you find Jurassic rocks. Normally, they lived in this position down at the bottom uh, center uh, position, and so common in Scunthorpe, where they were extracted when the people there were digging out the ironstone just above the, the Lias, that they were put on the town coat of arms. Unfortunately, the wrong way up. They should be curvy side down. Uh, and I'm also interested in sort of the way stamps portray bits of geology as well, and that'll become evident as we go on through. And, and here we've got a, a Gryphea that comes from Luxembourg. So they, they've got rocks of the same age over there. In one of my evening classes, a nurse piped up saying, oh yes, there's a, there's a disease that old folk have where their toenails get very thick and it's called uh, Gryphiosis. In fact, the proper name is onco Oncogryphiosis. Um, so if any of you suffer from that particular complaint, that's where these things got their names from, like the curved bits of, of old folks' toenails. So they're known as devil's toenails. They must have sort of, they're quite large, so they must have come from some sort of huge person and the devil fits the bill quite well. Now, whereas medieval folk didn't really know what fossils were, one or two people tried to describe what they found. They found fossils, they didn't really know what they were. So back in the mid 17th century, this chap was working in Oxfordshire and he found um, fossils. He found lots of things and he put them in his natural history book, which was called the Natural History of Oxfordshire. And he gave the illustration on the left is his, his drawing and he called it Hippocephaloides. Hippo, uh, horse, cephaloides, head. He thought this was a fossilized uh, baby horse's head. Uh, the shell is shown next to it and it, what it is is the internal cast of a bivalve. The shell has, has been fossilized, the shell is filled with mud, the shell has been dissolved away, and you're left with the internal impression of what the, the, the shell looks like. So those sort of big muscle scars in the middle, he thought were eyes. The, uh, the bits of the umbo, the, the pointy bit of the shell, he thought were ears. And the, uh, the hinge line, those sort of serrated lines, um, he thought was sort of uh, hair, the mane of the beast. Um, so in Dorset, uh, they're known as osses heads, horses heads, and they occur in this rock in Portland rocks uh, called the roach, and the shells tend to dissolve away, and you're left with just the internal casts of the beasts. So you can see there the holes in the rock, uh, and then you get the impression of the inside of the shell because the shell has been removed. It's, it was a very cheap and cheerful building stone, but you'll see it all over the place now. It's a white limestone 
with holes in it uh, and start looking at it when you see it. The outside of the shell is very different to the inside. That's the actual outside of the shell. It's got these little lumps and bumps, tubercles all over it. Uh, so it looks nothing like the inside. But if you're lucky and break the rock in the right place, you'll get the internal bit, the oss's head, and the external bit, the impression, showing where all those holes were on the, on the shell. Uh, in the same rock, the same thing happens to these um, well, gastropods, they're simple snail shells, but they're quite highly coiled. Uh, so the shell is gone, and what you're left with is the mud that filled the inside of the shell. And as geologists, you'll know that, oh yeah, the difference between the gastropods and the, the ammonites is the gastropods have got one chamber for the whole shell, and the ammonites and nautiloids have got lots of many chambers as the animal gets bigger, it sort of builds another chamber on. So these are those Portland screws, and because they come from Portland in Dorset. In Derbyshire, you get the same sort of thing affecting crinoids. You'll be familiar with those in Ireland. You've got lots of, of carboniferous limestone in Ireland. They're known as screw stones there as well. And the same sort of thing has happened. The shell, uh, the, 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 the central part of the shell has dissolved away and you're left with the internal structure. Uh, the beast is in the middle showing the long stem and the head with, with the, uh, the, uh, the fronds at the top. And then the picture on the top right showing you what the, what the head looks like. And then also, if you get individual bits of the, of the stem, it's a bit like um, the structure of polar mints. If you imagine a, a polar mint uh, packet up on its end, individual bits of the shell, sometimes individual bits of the stem uh, come apart and you sometimes get those individual round bits. And that's what the pictures are in, in the bottom part of the, the screen there. And they're known as St. Cuthbert's, be St Cuthbert's beads, again, because the Carboniferous limestone is found in the northeast. So they were thought to be um, the remains of his sort of um, uh, neck attire. And often you get them sort of strung and used as necklaces. Then you get these things called star stones. They're the same sort of thing. They're crinoids, but they've got a five sided, a pentagonal um, shape to them. It won't surprise you, they're known as, as, as um, star stones. It, it's a thing called pentacrinites. It comes from the lower Jurassic. Uh, again, it's a crinoid. It's got this stem that's, that's um, attached to the sea floor. And at the top, uh, branching arms that are living in the, on the sea floor. It picks up food and it sort of transports it to a mouth in the center. And then it's, it's, it's an animal that looks like a plant. Uh, so pentacrinites, a well-known fossil in the lower Jurassic. And from Lyme Regis area, you get huge sheets of the stuff. So if you imagine that's a bedding plane and you go to the Natural History Museum in London and you'll see a huge bit of bedding plane up on the wall, it would have been flat originally. Um, the longest I've seen these things is about 14 feet, what's that, about four meters long. Um, a bit like a, a meadow of, of um, seaweed you get in California. So these things lived in huge little meadows uh, and, uh, marvellous things. Often they're, they're preserved in pyrite as well, which is even more special. So star stones are these crinoid stems. Then you get snake's eggs. These were thought to be uh, what snakes produced when they reproduced, when they, when they mated. And you had to catch these eggs as they were thrown out of the, the snakes and then grind them down um, for medicinal purposes. And here you've got a medieval uh, illustration showing somebody um, catching this snake's egg and that's what they're known as. Uh, on the right hand side you can see a bit of chalk with one of these uh, sea urchins in it, you know, an echinoid, and this is a regular one uh, with lots of big lumps and bumps, tubercles, where the spines were attached. Uh, and that was what people thought they were, they thought they were snake's eggs. Uh, nowadays we're more enlightened, we know chalk was laid down or deposited as a mud on the sea floor, so these were sea creatures. Colloquially, they're also known as shepherd's crowns and fairy loaves. And in Hampshire, where I am now, um, they're called cow's kneecaps. And this one has got very small tubercles. This was perhaps a, a, more of a burrowing creature. The ones with the large tubercles were sort of um, uh, walking around on the, on the sea floor. And they also apply similar terms um, to the heart urchin, the microsters, which you'll find in the chalk, which you've got up in the, uh, the north of Ireland. They were thought to be uh, very useful things to have in your parlour, your milking parlour. Uh, 
So farmers found them on the fields and put them in the milking parlour. It would stop the milk going sour. They were thought to be quite good for that. And also if ground up uh, and put into water, they were th thought to be good for, for curing cows of all sorts of ailments. Well, they're calcium carbonate. They might well have some sort of uh, limited effect on helping the digestive system. The real borrowers, the ones that are flat and sort of spade shaped, spade like, uh, known as sand dollars in California. And depending on where you are, they're called mermaids, coins, sea cookies, snapper biscuits, sand cakes, cake urchins. And I discovered in South Africa, they're known as pansy shells because of the sort of petal arrangement of the, uh, the top of the shell. These are Miocene in age and they come from, I think these are uh, from Malta. Uh, and they live by boring into the sediment. They've got a mouth, they've got an anus, and they burrow into the sediment, take in sediment, and then spit it out at the other end and uh, form little tubes to get rid of all their waste material. Other star stones include corals, which again, quite common in, in rocks of all ages, um, a good indicator for shallow, warm, clear, uh, subtropical waters. And you get lovely examples. Uh, this case is a, a cut and polish sample, which the Victorians are very fond of doing. So star stones uh, were really sort of um, very well known from all over the place. Also applied to these things, uh, sort of starfish, simple as that. The one in the bottom is from Dorset and you get sort of uh, quite a lot of them down there, but they go back as far as the Ordovician. And they're, they're not uncommon at all. Um, but people thought they were star stones. They, they were sort of fossilized stars that had come down from the heavens. It looks like a drawing, but that is a real bit of, of Dorset uh, lias rock, um, came from a pebble, as you can see from the shape, and it's been cleaned to show all these sort of uh, starfish as on the right-hand side um, on this one sort of bedding plane. I'm not saying they all died at once. It might've just been a time of very little sedimentation and they all sort of died and just fell to the seafloor and, um, and sort of just lay there because there was no sediment to cover them. You'll know about these things. Um, the Dudley locust, so common uh, in Dudley where there was uh, workings for uh, the limestone, which was used as a flux in the iron industry uh, in the black country. Uh, we know what the name is, Kalimini, Blue and Baki, and they occur as flat ones or as curled up ones. You know what they are, they're related to arthropods, uh, sort of wood lice type creatures, um, and they also shed their skins. So you tend to get lots of fossils of them that aren't always the complete beast, but you might find a headpiece, a tailpiece, a middle piece as well. Uh, named in 1822, uh, and they featured in the 1839 book, uh, The Silurian System, which was done by Murchison, when they were sort of um, detailing all the fossils that were found in the Silurian rocks, which were quite handy for comparative purposes in other parts of the world. Uh, I should say that I think lots of other geologists all over the world tend to hate us because we had a, a large part in naming the geological systems and the, the names that people use for the, the, the divisions of the systems um, because British geologists were, were sort of busy and active um, doing that sort of thing. If not in Britain, then overseas as well. There was a business in Dudley selling these things. You could buy fossils and every museum, collector or whatever could buy things from these people who got them from the quarrymen who made a few bob on the side as they were digging out the stone um, uh, for flux, I say for, for melting the iron. And Again, when I was in Paris, I was amused to find a good example there. Um, okay, they can't spell Silurian, but that doesn't really matter too much. Um, but you, know, you get examples all over the place in the same way that we get good examples of, of fossils from overseas in all of our collections. Dudley coat of arms, we've got a trilobite in the middle of it, the Kilimini trilobite, the red thing underneath the castle. Um, if you collect cigarette cards, town coats of arms, there's another one there. And I discovered that the Trinity Geology Museum has a trilobite uh, on their crest. I must get hold of them and find out why. Um, perhaps look it up when you get home. The fact they've been used uh, in the past for perhaps ritual or ceremonial purposes is borne out by this example. This is a necklace made for an American uh, researcher in the 1930s based on what had been found in Native American graves. They seem to have, have had them as good luck charms 
And this, this researcher said to, to a Native American uh, in 1930, can you make me what these things probably sort of looked like when they were in use? Um, so you might see this as sort of a good example of, oh yeah, the Native American Indians uh, were, were, um, were, were sort of having these necklaces, you know, like the, the quills and eagles um, claws and stuff like that. Well, this is a modern version of what they think uh, people had in the past, but they've been finding them for, for hundreds of years and using them. So rocks of, of similar age found all over the place. Some bivalves or some um, bivalves of brachiopods and their brachiopods have got the name, in this case, of lamp shells. A shell on the left hand side showing a nice rounded um, valve with a hole at the top uh, for where the, the, the attachment sort of goes into the shell and attaches to the sediment. And they were thought to be perhaps Roman lamps. And the picture on the right showing you a Roman lamp to show the same sort of effect. So they're known as lamp shells, even in the literature today that they'll be termed lamp shells. You'll find them all over the place. Uh, a small creature lives in the shell, opens the shell, and then uh, filters sediment, uh, filters sediment from the water that sort of pulls into it and then spits out the stuff it doesn't want. If you're interested, and hopefully you will be, um, it's the fossil of the state of Kentucky. Uh, I'm not quite sure what age the rocks are in Kentucky, but American states, bless them, have all got uh, a state flower, a state rock, a state fossil. Um, we've got nothing quite like it over here. Um, we don't have to sort of uh, reach for things uh, to, to, to link our history to. We've got loads of it uh, around us already. Another bivalve, a bit more elongate with a longer sort of hinge line uh, and found in one particular place in Cornwall known as the Delabole butterfly. Picture in the top, it's in a slate. It's uh, sediments have been squashed, the sediments have, have spread out and sort of compressed the, sh the shells, and then they've been affected by earth movements and metamorphism, so you get sort of um, distorted fossils, and that's the one down in the, in the bottom left, bottom right hand side, and you can see the Chinese call them stone swallows. So butterflies, swallows, they look like they were flying creatures, but of course they were sea creatures that lived uh, generally attached to the sea floor. That's the quarry they came from, probably the largest slate quarry in, in, in Britain, and certainly in, in southern Britain, and it's been worked for hundreds of years. Uh, you'll find old postcards of it, you'll find lovely illustrations showing the slates stacked up. Often they were stacked up to, to uh, get frosted over the winter, so they would sort of split even more, and then a modern book just showing the sort of history and background of the village. So often, if there's a good story to be told, Hopefully, somebody will have written it up. Similar things happen in, again, the English East Midlands, I used to be somewhere in Peterborough. Um, there were these Collie Western stone mines, um, one particular bed of rock that was used for making the stone tiles on top of the buildings in that area. Uh, in Oxford, there's stuff called the Stonesfield Slate, um, and that's a local building. In fact, it's called the Collie Western uh, Tiler. Uh, and I think they're working again nowadays, digging out this stuff that split to use for replacement uh, stone tiles. And one of the things they had in the rocks there uh, were these water swallows, a gastropod with a very large flange on the outside of the shell, just to stop it sinking in the mud. Uh, but because it's mud, the, the sediment was compressed, the fossils were squashed a bit, and that's what they look like today. They're not that common. Uh, and the quarrymen called them these sort of colloquial names. Another brachiopod, the first fossil I ever came across and thought, I'm not going to cope with this, I can't remember what the names are, and I can't spell the names, let alone remember them. Pentamerus oblongus, um, called government rock. Why? Because the internal structure of the shell is such that um, when the shell fills with mud, the shell then dissolves away, you're left with an impression of the inside of the shell, and you get this sort of long broad arrow, which is equated to the, sort of the, the WD, War Department arrow, that you sort of get on, on uh, anything to do with the military, well, certainly over here, where well, you had them over there as well, so you know what government rock is. Uh, and it's Lower Silurian, and we find it in Shropshire. I don't know whether you've got bits over there, and what it might be called. Then they thought, well, there was this sort of time 
people hadn't really worked out what fossils were, so they were trying to explain their way in different things, in different ways. And you see, this is 1850s, not that long ago, really. And they still reckon this thing was a fossil serpent that measures eight foot three inches long and seven inches across and must have been, when alive, thousands of years ago, a reptile of immense strength. They thought it was a snake. It turned out to be a fossilized tree trunk, um, illustration from the time. And these things were um, odd. They weren't found very often, but then as soon as this sort of industrial revolution started and they started digging out coal, then they found all sorts of things that were preserved as fossils in the coal. There's a sort of coal measures type scene, a uh, swampy environment, these large sort of trees with this sort of um, serpent-like bark, which sort of fell in into the, the, the water and the sediment and got fossilized and, and confused people after that. If any of you have got connections in Glasgow, next time you go there, go to the Fossil Grove. They were digging uh, a new park. They found fossil tree trunk. They kept digging for the park, found some more fossil tree trunks. They thought, that's nice, we'll keep those and we'll make a little sort of tourist attraction to go with our park. They put a roof over the top in 1890 and then it's still there today uh, and people sort of go and see it and are amazed that this was a sort of a swamp floor to be found, what, 340 million years after it's sort of been there. The fact that there was a swamp where Glasgow is now and much of, of Northern Britain uh, is, is uh, you know, wondrous to behold. The building in the background of the colored picture is the, is the building over the, uh, the site. And then you can see this lovely approach with, fossil, with uh, flower beds and stuff like that. So Fossil Grove in Glasgow. You'll find it all over. Betty will probably have been to this place loads of times. My wife cycled the coast to coast cycling route um, last year and I made her go and see this. It was on the route, it was just one street away from the route and something I saw as a student oh, 50 odd years ago now. A fossil tree trunk found in local coal mine put in the churchyard so people can see it. Label telling you what it was all about. Um, the fossil tree, Latin name for it, um, the age of it. Uh, replaced since then by a more modern label giving you some idea as to what it was uh, or what it looked like when it was when it was sort of working. Uh, erected in the 1960s, I hadn't realized it was that, that common. I saw it in 1969, I think, I'm very impressed. But you'll find them all over the place. People put them in their gardens and things like that. Then in Dorset, remember that's where I come from, this place is an army firing range. They took over this area in the Second World War, said to the locals, if you move out, we'll let you move back after the war, but we need it for training. And they kept it and the locals never were allowed back. And the last people who were moved out have since died. Still an army training area, but they open it up at weekends and during the summer where you can walk through it and see it and enjoy it. And it's a lovely bit of unsport coastline, including this thing called the fossil forest. Beds dipping to the left, Beds changing from uh, marine sediments underneath, limestones, to freshwater sediments on the top, a variety of things. And in between, a fossil soil horizon with, with trees growing in it. Uh, the quarrymen found them, uh, they exploited the local rocks, they called them crow's nests, and this is what they look like. Uh, they're round, a big sort of donut-like things. And if you can imagine a tree stump in the center of that, as the, uh, the water sort of rose in the swamp, algae grew around the tree trunk. Sometimes the tree trunk fell over and the algae covered the top of it, like the one on the extreme right. And other times they sort of just uh, grew around it. And when the tree decayed, then you're left with these sort of big donut arrangements. If there was a stump, the algae grew over the top of the stump, like the one in the middle, just showing, showing you sort of a lump that's since split apart. There really is it's an impressive sight. You, you ought to go and see it if you get the chance. Uh, the tree trunks, if they're found in the quarries, look something like that. They've been scissified. They can be any height up to about 10 or 12 feet uh, in height. Sometimes found recumbent, sometimes found upright. And again, this is this fossil garden from this quarry on Portland, which are rocks of the same age. And again, my brother, about six foot. And uh, so you can see how big that thing is. So really quite an impressive, silicified, fossilized tree. 
Now, if you're a famous geologist, a famous geologist, and you'd like a sort of suitable monument for when you've when you've passed away, um, why not have a fossil tree? Um, Alfred Russell Wallace was the chap who wrote to Darwin saying, I've got this great idea about evolution. What do you think? And it was he and Darwin, or rather Darwin and he, uh, produced this paper on evolution that sort of changed the scientific world. And again, it, it sort of changed it, but again, people were constrained by this religious uh, doctrine of how old the earth was, 4004 BC. Uh, and people didn't want to believe that the earth might be a lot older than that because it sort of tended to, to take away from the, um, the truth of the Bible. One of my first evening classes, I had a person leave after the first session because she wasn't prepared to encounter uh, millions of years ago. Although a clergyman who was at the, at the, uh, the evening class as well was quite happy to stay and fit it into his sort of belief of what, uh, what the age of the earth was and how God had done his various bits and pieces. But there are evolutionists uh, in, in America or folk in America who don't believe in evolution. So they think that this is sort of um, some sort of heinous idea put forward to, to convert people. Wallace retired to Dorset, worked on fossil trees and included some work on the, the trees from Portland. Nowadays, the, the, uh, the trees have grown up around his, his grave and you've got to look a bit harder. But if you go into the cemetery, um, something that sticks up 12 foot is a bit easier to find than a normal gravestone. Just going through very quickly, I'm conscious of the time, uh, fossil fish uh, were thought to be the, the origin of these things. Uh, these are little peg teeth that were found and they were thought to be toadstones. They were thought to be the mythical stone found in the forehead of a toad that had magical properties. They are in fact the peg teeth of these Jurassic uh, fish. That's a modern day version showing you what they look like. And medieval manuscripts showing you a person extracting uh, said stone from head of toad, crushing it up and giving it to poorly person, uh, probably with plague. Um, known as a uh, Buffonites, and of course uh, Buffon is the, uh, uh, the, the Latin name for, for toad. Shark's teeth, well, we could go on at length about shark's teeth, come in a range of sizes, shapes, and all sorts of things. They were thought to be fossilized tongues, either in the case of the one on the right hand, uh, the left hand side, uh, the big one being a fossilized man's tongue, and the little ones hanging around the edge of that thing, uh, fossilized snake tongues. And they were thought to have mythical properties that if you, um, it's very difficult to imagine that people were afraid of, of food poisoning them uh, and being poisoned by people who invited them to supper. Uh, and the idea was you, you either carried, like the one on the right hand side, or your host might give you uh, on the table, one of these sort of um, arrangements where if you dipped your food and wine uh, into the teeth, or rather put the teeth into the food and wine, that would take away any poison that might be in the food, so you'd be safe. But, you know, we're talking 1500, uh, only, what, 500, 600 years ago, not very long ago at all. Then, uh, in the late 17th century, uh, a geologist said, well, actually, they come from sharks. And not a very convincing picture of a shark, but perhaps you'd only sort of seen a dead one. Um, and they actually became known as you know, shark's teeth rather than uh, men's teeth or, or adder's teeth. And the original name was Glossoptera, which was, was, was man's teeth. And then you find them uh, of huge ones. Uh, and I saw in the newspaper a couple of weeks ago that there were, I think, 87 found in, oh, here we are. Uh, 87 found in South Carolina uh, recently, uh, although that's not the, let me just go back one. Uh, it's the state fossil of Georgia uh, in the United States. These are sort of Miocene age rocks. And the largest one known, Megalodon, is, is the sort of the big jaw. And the, the scientist is holding a great white shark's jaw, which is quite big, but normally they're a lot smaller than that. Uh, and the, uh, the state fossil for, for, for um, uh, South Carolina is in fact a mammoth. And I was amused to see that it was the first fossil found in the USA. Um, well, it was dug up by, by slaves in 1725 and they didn't know what it was then, they thought it was a giant. Then you get fossilized slugs, 
well, we know them as the sort of crushing teeth of uh, uh, shell eating sharks. Um, Tychodus, a thing from the chalk, you, you've probably come across these things, but to early folks, they thought they were fossilized slugs because of that sort of pattern on the outside of the shell. I was formerly in Peterborough Museum. The Oxford clay around there has been exploited for bricks for hundreds of years. And then local archeologist um, collected these things. Well, he didn't collect them. He paid the quarrymen to put aside the things that they found. And he found all sorts of big reptiles. Um, so it was a sea deposit, a uh, mud deposit from, from the sea. So lots of swimming reptiles, uh, Cryptoclidus being the, the large plesiosaur and the large pliosaurs as well. Uh, so really sort of quite impressive. And the Victorians had a big thing about the fight between the ichthyosaur and the plesiosaur. That's the, the, the top engraving. They were so common at some places, they're actually sort of used in sort of local, um, local government. This is the Urban District Council stamp of street in Somerset. If any of you wear Clark's shoes, this is where they used to come from. They don't anymore. There's a big sort of designer outlet there where the factory used to be. But there were quarries locally that dug out the, the lower lias for uh, cement stones. They found lots of these reptiles. And even still today, you'll find sort of an ichthyosaur uh, on the street sign as you sort of drive into, into the town. That's the sort of beast they were finding and the museums loved it, and lots of them come from Somerset. And even in Warwickshire, where the Jurassic um, goes up through the centre of, of, of England, you'll find the same, similar sort of thing up there, uh, Stockton in, in Warwickshire. That's what Nicthysaur looks like, a cross between a, a shark and a dolphin. Um, a dolphin's got a sort of lateral uh, tail, whereas the, the Nicthysaur has got a sort of vertical tail. Similar story, at Upton on Soar, just oh sorry, uh, Barrow upon Soar, just north of Leicester, they were digging out for the cement stones, found a, a big plesiosaur fossil, and that went to the museum in Leicester, and that's where it uh, resides today, uh, called colloquially the Barrow Kipper. Um, but it appears on the town coat of arms, which is really quite interesting. Very quickly, I'm conscious that the time is running on. Uh, fossils have been not the cause of wars, but they've been influenced or, or had a, a, a bearing in wars. In Maastricht, in uh, Holland, the, the local quarries, underground quarries there, found various reptiles. Napoleon, in his expansion through Europe, thought these were quite good things to have. So he pinched them and took them back to Paris. And the, the specimen that was found, this huge mosasaur, uh, is actually to be found now in the museum in Paris, rather than the museum in the, uh, in the Netherlands. They've got a, a replica of it to be found there. But to be fair, um, the museum there is excellent. It's well worth going to have a look at. Modern day stuff on the ground floor, and then the fossil stuff uh, on the first floor, including loads of these mosasaurs, which were huge things that were preyed on the pliosaurs and the the uh, ichthyosaurs, um, huge 30 foot beasts with huge teeth. I should have perhaps put this in earlier. This was discovered in early part of the 18, uh, 1700s. It was thought to be a child that was crushed during the biblical deluge. Uh, and then um, the, the rocks, the, the bones preserved in the rocks. Uh, it was given the Latin name of Homo de Luvi Testis, the, the person who witnessed the flood. Uh, it, it appeared in this book of 1726 as being evidence of the flood because that was how people could explain how fossils were found in rocks a long way from the sea. Uh, the biblical deluge being an important sort of feature. A geologist looked at the specimen, a bit more enlightened, excavated around the, the arm part of the, the beast and produced that sort of specimen you see in the middle of the picture and found there were arms and legs there. Uh, and it turned out to be um, this thing, uh, a fossil salamander, uh, found right on the Swiss uh, German border, which is why it appears in the, the, uh, the Swiss geology book. Uh, the actual museum where these things are found nowadays is, is in the Netherlands, uh, because that was the, uh, the other sort of left side of the lake. But the flood, the deluge being the important thing, that could explain how these things were found in rocks. Um, and that was what geologists had to contend with right up until the last century. I mentioned stamps before. Stamps, 
give you a little sort of uh, vision into people's understanding of what, what geology and landscape is about. And here the Swiss stamp using that fossil salamander uh, and part of a series of rocks, uh, a part of a series of, of stamps that show fossils uh, from the rocks. In my department at Leicester, we had on the wall one of these things, um, just the impression of uh, a hand or a forelimb of, of a, a reptile. Nobody's ever found the complete reptile. And as geologists, you would love to find a trackway with an animal dead at the end of it, showing, oh yeah, that's the animal that's produced those things. Um, this has never been found. It was found uh, in Germany uh, and excavated there. It was found in Liverpool and it's the symbol for the Liverpool uh, Geological Society. I'm not sure what your, your um, symbol is. Uh, and it's thought to have looked something like that. Uh, that's in Germany. There's a trackway behind and the, the beast uh, is a bronze model. Uh, dinosaur tooth, okay, Gideon Mantell found the tooth. Um, in fact, his wife found the tooth. He was visiting a, uh, an elderly patient. His wife sat outside, looked at a pile of rock, found the tooth. Uh, he's credited with, uh, with naming it as a Iguanodon. Um, the quarry where the, the rocks, the road mending rocks came from were examined. They found more of the bones and they came up with what must have been uh, this thing. They thought it was a, a, an Iguana type lizard. And uh, they didn't have a complete one, but they reckon that's the bones they had uh, in, in solid outline. They had this bone left over. They thought, mm, a bit like a rhinoceros horn. And that was a the model they made of it. And that was the model that appeared uh, for the great exhibition. And New Year's Eve, the, uh, the, the maker of the model um, had a, um, well, you'd see a party where they sat inside the beast and had their New Year's Eve meal uh, before it was put into this arrangement um, down in Sydenham in South London. There's the fossil garden. Uh, I keep meaning to go there. I've not been there. And you'll find what the Victorians thought were the living beasts of, of uh, the mid-Victorian period, of, of the historic period, um, put up where the Crystal Palace was re-erected. Unfortunately, it burnt down, but they're still there today. They're made of concrete uh, and, uh, and plaster and stuff, but worth going to have a look at. Their interpretations weren't always correct. Uh, revised the opinion when in, in uh, Belgium, I think 14 specimens were found. They'd been perhaps stampeded over a cliff. They'd got, gone down into the Carboniferous rocks, and this is Cretaceous rocks they're in. Um, they went down this deep gully. They were found by coal miners uh, in the last century, in the 1870s. And they realized then that this, this fossil that had been found didn't have a rhinoceros type horn. It had a big spiky thumb. And that's the, the bone showing you that the, the, uh, the, the thumb in its, its right place. And then because the fossils were found, the original fossils were found near Maidstone, it appears on their coat of arms. But I think in the top picture, it shows that the, the artist didn't realize the importance of that spiky thumb. And you can't really see them on that, that, that dinosaur on the left-hand side. But the more recent one that's produced um, shows the spiky thumb in all its gory detail. When they came to, when they came to uh, build a, an impression of what the beast was like, they put all the bones together. They started off with the idea that mm, it looks like a, it's either a, an emu or a kangaroo type setup. It's on its hind legs. So they based their skeletal reconstruction on an emu and a kangaroo. And you can see the specimen just by the knee on the left hand side, there's the sort of emu and the kangaroo. And in fact, they had to sort of file away some of the bones of the tail to make it fit their interpretation. Whereas nowadays, we think it's more like a, a four-legged, a, a four-footed beast rather than a two-legged beast, uh, you know, walking on four legs rather than two legs. You'll see it over the Sedgwick Museum in Cambridge, thing on the left with the big spiky thumb. And more modern interpretations show it like this, walking on four legs, uh, and you find trackways in Dorset and on the Isle of Wight. Um, it's on a stamp in, one of our own stamps, when uh, postage rate was 22p. What is it now? 65 or something like that. Uh, named by Owen. Um, I shan't say any more about him. Very briefly, flying reptiles included things like the pterodactyls and the pteranodons. Years ago, I went for an interview for the Isle of Wight Geology Museum in Sandown on the Isle of Wight. Lovely material, but in a room over their Victorian library. Uh, rebuilt 
or rather moved into a new rebuilt building for the millennium. And this is Dinosaur Isle, as it's now called. And the shape of the, the building is supposed to represent the shape of the, the flying reptile because they've got bits of all sorts of things. The Isle of Wight, uh, probably the best place in Britain for the, the range of dinosaurs that have been found. We've all seen mammoth skeletons, uh, and that gave rise to lots of ideas of uh, giants being around in, in the medieval period. Um, people recognized leg bones, they recognized um, rib bones, and they said, well, this must have come from a huge person because it came from a, a mammoth. Um, what's little known is that they also gave rise to the idea of the cyclops. Why they give rise to the cyclops? Because in the Mediterranean, there was a pygmy elephant found, and the pygmy elephant, like all elephants, had the big hole in the front of its head. Uh, and this was thought to be the site of the, the original eye of the beast. Um, they didn't find the complete skeleton, obviously, they just found the skull with the, the single eye hole. And that's why the Cyclops myth um, grew up uh, from that. And then to finish on the, uh, the Irish elk, that's perhaps not Irish and certainly not an elk, um, a large giant deer. Um, this is from your uh, Natural History Museum in Dublin. And then um, a lovely illustration showing a person walking up to the thing, trying to feed it with their arm outstretched. The picture below showing it as a cave painting from the Paleolithic caves in, in uh, southern France. And then a couple of stamps from your country on the left hand side, and then France and uh, a recent one from Russia on the right hand side. So it was covered all of Europe, not just Ireland, um, even though it was sort of found um, in Ireland. I found this coat of arms. Uh, I'm not sure what date it is, but it's your coat of arms and it sort of shows the elk or rather the giant deer um, as a supporter of, of the arms. Also to be found as supporter on the, the arms of I think, County Down and on, on the arms of Northern Ireland um, between 1924 and 1972. Not part of the arms, but as supporters to the arms. Um, so you never sort of get the uh, um, the, the two supporters normally. And then finally, you'll be pleased to know, um, medieval item found by plot and thought to be, well, you can read the Latin inscription, um, scrotum humanum, uh, thought to be a sort of large arrangement from a, a, a giant person, a part of their anatomy that we won't go into too much. Although a bit later on, it was reproduced in another book saying, well, actually it's the leg bone of some large beast uh, it's a, a large dinosaur, in fact, um, but Plot got it wrong. It's got this lovely name um, that sort of uh, stays with you. And if you take away nothing else from tonight, Scrotum Humanum uh, as being a, a medieval name for a fossil. Femur of, of Omegalosaurus. Okay, that was a quick run through, very quick run through. Some fossils, what they tell us about medieval thought, what they tell us about uh, what people thought of them and how they were described in the past. And like all geologists, we'd like people to think about not just the fossil itself, but all the stories that go with them, how they lived, how they died, where they're found and all the rest of it. So on that happy note, I think we'll sort of uh, bring it to a close. Um, as geologists, we perhaps don't collect as much as we used to because we rather sort of like to leave things for other people to enjoy. So don't put your hammer to rocks and collect fossils, just sort of um, take photographs and leave nothing but footprints, I think the expression. Okay, you can breathe a sigh of relief, have a quick glass, cheers. And if there are any questions, then we'll see if I can answer them. If there aren't, then we can all go home and see what's on telly. Okay, thank you. How do I stop my share?